Okay, so for our final section for today, we're going to give you some concrete tools for actually measuring things in the economy. Um, but first, before we do that, we need to talk about what the economy is. Um, you've often heard people talk about the economy. It comes up in every presidential election. It comes up in every debate that you have with people on Facebook where we talk about the economy does something or the economy is growing or the economy is great or um, because of the pandemic, the economy tanked. Um, what is this economy? Um, and how do we even measure what it is? Um, whoa, we lost that. So you listened to a couple podcasts about what the economy means and what it entails. Um, and what's fascinating is it's a fairly recent invention. Um, as you um, learned in the podcast, it was invented in part during like World War II as a way of, of measuring a country's output and making sure that um, we're creating enough stuff for war. Um, but then after the war, we were able to say, are we creating enough stuff for post-war recovery? Um, and we were able to create specific measures for how efficient the economy was running, um, again, using this economy idea. Um, and it's, it's, it's a useful metaphor for talking about how just how all of these different markets and firms and, and people are interacting with each other, but it's still kind of this loosey-goosey weird term um, that doesn't quite measure everything. Um, the number that's most commonly used and that we've been using throughout this session here is this idea of the gross domestic product or GDP. Um, that's often divided by the number of people in the country, so you get GDP per capita. Um, and that's kind of a rough measure of the average income for a person every year. Um, but again, that is not equally spread. You like If we look at GDP per capita in the United States, that's going to include um, the ultra poor and it's going to include Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates um, who have huge annual incomes, um, but it averages it all out down to some level of, of average GDP per capita. Um, GDP, um, includes a few different values that you can calculate. Um, private consumption, if you just calculate all of the money that people spend at stores and um, at factories and buying services, um, that is private consumption. You can also calculate investments. You count how much money people put in banks and how much people invest in companies. That's part of GDP. You can count exports, and so you count um, how much stuff goes out of the country and is sold for what prices. And then you can count government expenditures. So how much, um, if the government builds a new freeway, that counts as GDP. So all of those things, if you add them all up um, and then subtract whatever things you're importing, that is GDP. Um, and you can become a macroeconomist and spend all day calculating GDP and that's your job. Um, which, cool, go do that. Um, but we don't care about actually calculating this number. Um, but what's interesting about this is it's like four simple things that are all kind of lumped together. But why did we settle on this? Why does everybody love this number specifically? And if you think about the podcast that you listen to, it's mostly not because it's like the most accurate number of, of trying to get the pulse of the economy. It's just because it's easy to measure. Um, you can calculate these numbers and you can figure out what's happening. Um, but it's not necessarily the most accurate number. It's not the best way of measuring kind of the health of a society or the health of a market economy. There are all sorts of problems with it. Um, so if you look here, um, this is the Deepwater Horizon oil spill from I think 2010 in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, BP's um, oil rig here exploded and it did all sorts of bad environmental damage throughout the Gulf Coast region. Um, and the government had to spend lots of money to clean it up all of those expenditures counted as GDP. So the Deepwater Horizon um, tragedy here actually boosted GDP um, because the government was spending money on stuff. Um, when there are hurricanes, they're really bad, they damage all sorts of stuff, they're huge and tragic, and then government responses and private sector responses to them requires like rebuilding stuff and that all counts as GDP. Um, and so it is possible to have like GDP growth following natural disasters, which feels counterintuitive. Um, but it's because it's just one of the numbers in that, in that GDP equation. Um, another issue with this is that it doesn't count um, things that we think should count. If you pay a babysitter informally, none of that counts as GDP. If you um, have kids at home and you're raising them, 
and you might be out of the labor market, none of the stuff that you do with children at home counts as GDP. And none of it counts as, as helping the economy. Um, and so it's not kind of the greatest measure of, of any of this stuff. It's missing lots of parts of the economy. It's just getting like stuff that people buy and stuff that people export and stuff the government spends money on. That's all it's really picking up. So it's not, again, kind of the most fine-grained measure of what society is actually doing with markets. Um, so when we talk about GDP and we talk about these other things, um, as messy as it is, it's kind of the, the measure that we're stuck with. Um, we do need to consider different ways of measuring it across time and across space. Um, and this is where you'll, you'll learn some specific tools for doing this. So when, you, when we talk about measuring dollars or measuring values across space, what this means is that in some states, um, it costs more money to buy groceries than in other states. Hawaii is really expensive to buy groceries in because you have to import like all sorts of food from mainland United States into Hawaii. Um, and so that makes the prices more expensive. Even within the United States, if you are living in Atlanta, um, downtown Atlanta, food prices will be some amount. But then if you go to rural Georgia somewhere, the prices are probably going to be cheaper. If you go to New York, to New York City, um, the prices are going to be more expensive. If you move outside of New York, like to upstate New York, to like Ithaca, where Cornell is, the prices are probably going to be cheaper. And so you have all sorts of prices depending on the market that you're in. Um, this is especially true for like housing. Um, in San Francisco, if you want to buy like a small house, it's going to be millions of dollars. If you want to buy a massive mansion in like Dallas, it's going to be like $300,000. Um, and so what you have to do is if you're trying to compare somebody's salary or a country's GDP, um, you need to adjust that for what people can actually buy with it um, and what that actually means in the place that you live in. So the way you do this is with this idea of purchasing power parity or this PPP, where you take some value, but then you adjust it for any location differences. Um, and so generally what you do is you just say like, I want to look at the price of a gallon of milk in all 50 states and in the major metropolitan regions in all of the different states. And then you can do some mathematical adjustments to figure out kind of what the general price of milk is in the whole country. And you can see where it's more expensive, where it's less expensive, and you can account for these weird um, regional effects. You can also do the same thing worldwide. Um, and if a gallon of milk costs more in Canada than it does in the United States, or less in Honduras than it does in the United States, you can make those adjustments. Um, one, one way of thinking about this is The Economist, the magazine, has this thing called the Big Mac Index, where um, what they do is they figure that McDonald's, because it's basically in every single country around the world, um, they have standard goods that they provide. Um, you like every country has a Big Mac. And so if you go and you figure out the price of a Big Mac in every single country, you can make adjustments to the purchasing power of these of, of the currency based on Big Mac prices. So for instance, um, in January 2020, um, these numbers here are what the Big Mac index shows. So in the United States, on average, it was $5.67 for a Big Mac. In China, once you adjust for like converting Chinese currency into um, US currency, a Big Mac is $3.12, which is way cheaper than the United States. And so um, their money is kind of undervalued in relation to the United States. So it is like um, if you see that a building costs like a million dollars in US money, um, that's not actually a million dollars in US money in the US. Um, it's far cheaper um, because of this like adjusting for purchasing power. Um, in the EU, Big Macs right now are 458 instead of 567, so that's cheaper because um, the euro is not as strong as the dollar um, at this point. And so this is kind of one um, kind of it started off as a joke, this Big Mac index, but like it's still like people can use it as a serious measure. Um, even if you don't use the official Big Mac index, you'll often if you go to like the World Bank, um, they have a massive database of all sorts of economic measures. Um, and you'll see, if you look up like GDP per capita, it will say something like in a footnote that says PPP adjusted, which means they've gone through all the calculations to adjust the values for um, different, to account for differences in place. And so we, we care about that. Um, so pay attention to that. That's one way, like it's important to make those adjustments when you're looking across countries or across states. 
We also care about um, changes over time because the value of money changes as time goes on. Um, so you'll often see two different numbers um, listed, um, or economists will talk about two different numbers um, when you look at data. Um, one number is this idea of nominal dollars or nominal numbers. The easiest way to remember this is like nominal numbers are the things that were written down at the time. So if you bought a house in 1950, or if you didn't, none of you were alive in 1950. Um, I was not alive in 1950. If your grandparents bought a house in 1950, it was probably like $10,000, um, $15,000 maybe. That is the nominal price. That is what was they wrote down at the time. This house costs $15,000. That's it. So that is the nominal value. It's whatever was recorded at the time of the transaction or the thing happening. So if you're looking at nominal GDP per capita, um, in the United States, it was some number back in like 1930. Um, we didn't really track it back then, but it may have been like $2,000 a year or something. I just made that up. Don't cite me on that. Um, but it's some low amount. Um, but that's what was written down. But the issue there is if we look back and we say my grandparents bought a house for $15,000 and now houses cost like $400,000, that's crazy. Houses are like 100 times more expensive or like a ton times more expensive, um, which is true. Housing has gotten more expensive, but it wasn't because it like you can't go buy a house for $15,000 nowadays. That's impossible. Um, that's because that value of whatever the $15,000 could buy you back in 1950, that's all changed nowadays. And that's because of inflation. Um, that value has kind of inflated over time. Um, and so instead of thinking about nominal numbers, you can also think about real numbers, which is the adjusted, uh, it's basically the value of today's dollars uh, or the value in today's dollars or any other year's dollars. So if you have a house that you bought in 1950 for $15,000, there are ways of adjusting that 15,000 up into um, the numbers for today, for 2020. And you can make that adjustment um, and you essentially scale up those $15,000 and it's gonna be probably in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so it's not gonna be wildly more expensive to buy a house today. It is probably more expensive, but it's not like from 15,000 to half a million, it's going to be um, some high value to a, a slightly higher value. So the way you do this, there's an actual um, formula for converting a nominal number into a real number. Um, and so it's, it's this formula here. If you can find the nominal value, so if it was $15,000 back in um, 1950, as long as you have this magical thing called a price index, which we'll talk about in a minute, if you can find a price index, then if you can take that 15,000, divide it by this price index, divide it by 100, that will let you convert the value into today's dollars. Um, the way you get this price index is kind of like the Big Mac index, where you find one thing and track its price across space, but here you're going to find one thing and track its price over time. So if you want to find the price of bread in 1950, um, like for a regular loaf of sandwich bread, and then see what it was in 1951, and then 1952, and 1953, you can find the trend in how much it, it costs to get a loaf of sandwich bread. And in theory, that shouldn't be like doubling and tripling in price because it's just bread. Um, and so any increases that you see in the price of bread are just essentially due to inflation. Um, and you can use mathy or mathematical ways of just getting kind of the inflation part out of that, and that becomes the price index. Um, so what economists do, rather than just look at a loaf of bread, um, because that might have some variation in it, what they do instead is they look at a whole bunch of goods. They call it a basket of goods. Um, and so rather than just a loaf of bread, they create essentially, um, so in the United States, we use this thing called the consumer price index which includes bread. Um, it includes all of these different things that are just kind of a big basket of normal staple things that people buy. It's like breakfast cereal, milk, coffee, chicken, wine, meals, snacks, jewelry, gas, sports equipment, uh, pet products, toys, college tuition, postage prices, telephone services, funeral expenses. All of this stuff gets lumped into kind of a basket of typical things that Americans buy. And so what you can do is if you get that basket of goods and you say, how much would this whole thing have cost back in 1950? 
you write down that price and then see how much that whole thing would have cost in 1951, write down that price, figure out how much change there was, and then that is the price index that you get. Actually calculating that price index, you typically don't have to do. Um, the Federal Reserve provides the CPI, which is the Consumer Price Index, for you. You can download it directly from their website. You don't need to worry about calculating, like figuring out what's in the basket of goods. They just provide the price index for you. And then you can just plug that into this equation here, and then it lets you calculate $1950 up to $2020. And in the example for today, um, in the resources page, um, I show an example of how to do this in Excel, um, how to get the, the CPI values from the Fed, and then how to make calculations, um, both in Excel and kind of a shortcut way online. So you'll get experience with that. Um, but it's important to do this because um, the meaning of money changes all the time um, depending on time. Um, so one, one of my hobbies, actually, is when I watch old movies um, or read old books where they talk about, like, this person spent $5 on something, um, I actually love to convert that money into today's money so it makes more sense. Um, so a good example of this is um, this movie here. This is It's a Wonderful Life. Um, it's an old movie from like 19, the 1940s with Jimmy Stewart here. Um, it's a typical Christmas movie. Um, and the main plot, if you're not familiar with it, is there's this guy here. He's the main character. His name is George Bailey. He lives in a small town in upstate New York. Um, and he's living through the Great Depression and living through World War II. And he's kind of down on his luck. He wants to go see the world. And every time he's about to go see the world, something bad happens, like the Great Recession or the Great Depression back then, um, or a war breaks out and he has to stay at home. And there's all sorts of bad stuff that happens to him. He runs kind of the local bank for the neighborhood and he gives out mortgages to people, but there's kind of an evil banker who represents like the, the evils of capitalism. Um, his name is Mr. Potter and he's trying to become a monopolist and take over the town and he is kind of enemies with this small town banker here. And so that's kind of the main conflict that you have. Um, and so they talk about money a lot in this movie. And it's like a heartwarming movie, but like when they mention these, these numbers, it seems like ridiculously tiny. Um, and so like every time I watch this movie, I have my phone out and then I, every time they mention a number, I Google like the, the price conversion um, and I adjust for inflation. So for instance, um, the small bank that this George Bailey character runs is called the Building and Loan. Um, the town's one taxi driver is named Ernie and he gets a mortgage in 1928 for $5,000 to build his own house. And every time I hear that, I'm like, that is like, he bought a house for $5,000, that is ridiculous. Um, if you convert that to 2020 money, that's $72,000. Which again, like, if you're in like metropolitan Atlanta, that's not enough to buy a house. But if you're like in the middle of Kansas, that's a, that's a good mortgage for like a good small family home. Um, and so that's, 5,000 is tiny, but back then it was the equivalent of $70,000, which is sizable. Um, at one point in the movie, this evil banker tries to make an offer to um, George Bailey here to essentially buy him out and make him become um, his own employee so he can shut down this, this small town bank. And so he asks the main character here, he says, how much is your salary right now? What are you getting paid? And so the main character says, I'm getting $45 a week which sounds ridiculous nowadays. Like that means he's earning like less than $200 a month, um, which is way below the poverty line. How is he even surviving? If you convert that to $2020 and multiply it by 52, so it's an annual income, he's earning $44,000, dollars $43,000 a year, which again is not huge, but if you're going into like nonprofit management, that's, you're looking at salaries around that range. Um, and that's like a, a low end middle class salary right there. And so, yeah, like it, it, he's not ultra poor, but he's not super well off, but that's a more reasonable number. Um, what this evil banker does is he says, how about you come work for me and I'll pay you $20,000 a year. Um, and again, like if you think about that in today's dollars, that's not great. Like $20,000, that's not a huge amount. That's tiny. That's poverty level right there. Um, but if you convert that to today's money, what he was actually offering was essentially, 
almost $400,000 a year in salary. And so if you look at that, he was going from like his current salary was 43,000 and then going up to 370,000, that's a huge increase. That's almost 10 times his salary. Um, and then spoiler alert, he doesn't take the, the job. He turns it down because he's an evil banker. We don't want to work with him. Um, but again, like converting these tiny numbers that are like the old numbers from the 1940s up until today makes a giant difference um, when, you're think when you're watching old movies. Um, one of the main plot points, or the key plot point, is um, at one point this evil banker steals eight thousand dollars from um, the small, from George Bailey's small bank, and it causes George Bailey to attempt suicide. And an angel comes down and like grants him a wish of seeing what his life would be like if he didn't ever exist. And that's kind of the main famous part of the movie. But again, like if you're watching this. Um, he loses eight thousand dollars and they call in like these bank examiners and federal agents like swarm in and it's this giant deal over eight thousand dollars which again is not a huge amount like nowadays banks misplace that all the time like it's eight thousand dollars if you convert that to today's money that's a hundred thousand dollars that was suddenly embezzled which is a sizable amount compared to eight thousand um so going through this exercise is actually like kind of fun when you watch old-timey movies, um, even like movies from the 80s or 90s, it's still fun to convert stuff um, because we've had inflation since the 90s and even since like early 2000s. Um, the values that we have are not the same. Um, and so it, it's fun for movies, but it's also fun. It also uh, has negative consequences. Like the minimum wage was set like 20 years ago at $7.25 an hour and it has not moved since, which means um, $7.25 in the year 2000 is not the same as $7.25 today. It's actually worth a lot less today um, because of inflation. And we have not moved um, the minimum wage up to keep up with inflation. So now it's worth like six-ish dollars um, in 2000 money. And so it's not, not great. We should be able to keep up with inflation to help kind of provide some bare minimum wages to people. Um, so keeping track of inflation and thinking about it is, is an important thing to do when you think about kind of values that you're measuring. Um, inflation in general is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, the Federal Reserve, one of their jobs, they have, a, they have two jobs as the Fed. Um, one is to pay attention to unemployment and try to keep unemployment low um, and make sure everybody's employed and, and provide um, monetary policy and fiscal policy that or provide provide policies that make it so people can get jobs. The other thing they care about is inflation and they try to maintain good levels of inflation. That's typically around two to three percent. And so we want some level of inflation. And there's a reason for that. It's because it encourages spending where if your dollar today buys more than your dollar tomorrow, like if you hold on to a dollar bill for 20 years, 20 years later, it's not going to be worth a dollar. It's going to be worth like 80 cents that encourages you to spend that dollar right now instead of holding on to it for years and years and years. And so it encourages spending, it encourages people to go out into the world and develop stuff and capitalist growth happens and, and that's what we care about. Um, so good inflation is two to 3%. If inflation's too high, if you get something like hyperinflation, then um, you have to spend that money like immediately. And that's where you get pictures from like pre-Nazi Germany of people pushing wheelbarrows full of cash as soon as they get paid because if they wait like two hours, then it's gonna like drop half in value and it's gonna be super bad. Um, that's, that's kind of, we don't want super high inflation. We also don't want deflation, which is negative inflation. Um, this, is, this is a really bad phenomenon because it's the opposite of encouraging people to spend. It means that your dollar today buys less than your dollar tomorrow. So that means if you hold on to your dollar, it's gonna be worth like $1.20 a year from now just because of deflation. And so if that happens, nobody spends money. It seizes up the economy because it encourages um, saving and discourages spending. Nobody wants to spend their money because it's gonna be worth more if they just wait. So we don't, like, we don't want deflation. Um, Macroeconomists that work for the Fed kind of fear and fear deflation. They never want to see that happening um, because that's a bad sign for the economy. It means everybody's going to stop doing stuff. So we don't want that to happen. Um, so a couple final issues we want to talk about here with measuring stuff. Um, so giving you some tools of how you can convert um, 
GDP values and, and whatever dollar amounts you want to future amounts and past amounts and across time or across space. Um, and that's all good. Um, and we've talked about how you can measure GDP by just plugging in a whole bunch of numbers and it spits out kind of the general health of the economy. Um, but the issue here is that it doesn't measure human well-being. It doesn't measure kind of the health of a society. It just measures how much stuff you're making and how much investment you're making and how much you're spending on infrastructure. Um, and it's really easy to lose track of that when you're looking at GDP values. Um, even in your naked economic in your Naked Economics book, there's this quote in there that says, there are no value judgments whatsoever attached to traditional GDP calculation. It's just raw data, raw numbers, totally objective numbers, and we can just trust everything that's in there. The problem with that, though, is that this is not true. Um, the numbers that we get in GDP um, reflect the values of whoever decided that GDP was a good thing. So there's a reason that investment numbers are in there and not like... Um, number of hours spent with children at home or spent with children in school or um, the number of hours, like any education out, like non-money based education stuff is not in there. The health of the of people is not in there. We don't incorporate like, um, like average uh, heart rates or anything like that. Um, we know nothing about health. Um, we know nothing about access to social services. We don't, we don't have a way of tracing like, inequality. That's not built into the GDP measure. Um, we don't measure literacy in GDP. We don't measure um, childhood mortality in GDP. None of that stuff is included. It's just investment and exports um, and kind of finance world type stuff. Um, and this has been an issue for a while. So Robert F. Kennedy, um, back in like the 60s and 70s, he was a, a critic of using GDP as kind of a measure of a whole society's health. Um, in this quote here, he says that like, GDP doesn't measure the health of our children, quality of education, joy of their play. Um, if you build a really fun playground, um, that's the same price as like a non-fun playground. GDP doesn't distinguish that, but like it's better to build the fun playground. Um, it doesn't include beauty of our poetry, strength of our marriages, intelligence of public debate, or integrity of public officials. It's really just how much stuff you're making. And that's all it's really reflecting. And so some people have been trying to find alternatives to measuring kind of how well a country is doing economically that go beyond GDP. Um, the World Bank has this thing called the Human Development Index, um, which tries to measure a whole bunch of things. They look at a whole bunch of different dimensions. They do include GDP um, as kind of having a decent standard of living, but they also look at education and they look at life expectancy. So it's health and knowledge and GDP all combined into this human development index. And so you can trace countries' um, levels of human development over time, and this, they argue, is a, is a better measure of, of how well a country is doing rather than just how much they're exporting and how much they're producing. Um, so that's one possible measure. Um, some people have argued that you can just look at the unemployment rate. Um, one issue with that is that it's not always super accurate. Um, if somebody's been unemployed for like a year, they'll drop out of some measures of unemployment. Um, if they're no longer actively seeking a job because they want to stay home or they want to, they're willfully unemployed, then they're, they're no longer counted in the unemployment rate. Um, if you had a full-time job with a 401k and, and awesome benefits in 2008 and you lost your job then and you've just been doing gig work ever since um, and you're kind of underemployed um, and you haven't like started a business and gotten a new 401k, you're going to be undercounted in this measure here. And so it's, again, not the greatest way. Um, there, you can also measure poverty in a country and try to have that be a, a measure of how well the country is doing. The issue there is you have relative poverty. Um, so often when we think of poverty, um, we think of just like abject poverty, people living in cardboard boxes along beaches in Bangladesh or something. Um, and that's not what poverty looks like. Um, in the United States, most people have refrigerators, um, even poor people. Um, but that's because like that's just kind of, we have this this bare minimum standard of living and like in general people who have who are on medicaid who are on wic who have access to all sorts of like um housing vouchers and stuff they will have you know technology they will have a stove or an oven or a fridge or something but they're still very 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 poor 
and this is often used as an excuse for not supporting them. Um, a few years ago, there was a, a segment on Fox News where they reported that like 95% of poor people have fridges, and so they're not really poor. Um, and so in absolute terms, sure, they're not poor. They're earning more than like villagers in the middle of nowhere in, e in Eritrea or Ethiopia. They are like in absolute terms, they're earning more dollars. But when you account for differences in space, they're not earning like they're still very, very poor in this country. Um, and so trying to just measure poverty is not going to be the most accurate way of of gauging a, a country's health. If you had like a refrigerator index, we would look great in the United States, um, but we still have widespread poverty and underemployment. And so that's going to get missed. Um, another measure that some people have argued is having a measure of the size of government. Um, ideologically, this has gone both ways. Um, looking at like um, more from the right, they've measured size of government. Having too big of a government means you're not as developed and you want a small government. Um, from the other side, you have the larger the government, the larger the social safety net, the more developed you are. Um, but because that's super inconsistent based on ideology, it's not like the greatest, most consistent measure of kind of an economy. Um, similarly, people have tried to measure the health of an economy by budget surpluses and deficits. Um, but that's also tricky because like governments run on deficits and that's how like central governments work. That's why we have things like the Fed and the European Central Bank and um, all sorts of central banking systems. Everything operates on debt because that's just how macroeconomics works. And so again, it's not the greatest measure. Um, so best alternative to GDP is we have no idea. Um, there's no unified, perfect way of measuring the health of the economy. Um, HDI is cool, but um, you have to rely on the World Bank creating it every year, and sometimes they're slow. Um, and you have to trust that the that the data that they're putting out, and you have to basically say, does life expectancy plus literacy plus GDP represent human development truly? Maybe. I don't know. Um, GDP is kind of the standard and it will be for a very long time mostly because most of the infrastructure for it exists it's very easy for them to calculate the federal reserve um, issues um, gdp calculations every quarter you can go to their website and get the latest gdp calculations whenever you want um, and go back in time for decades um, and european central bank does the same thing like all main central banks and and most federal governments around the world have a way of showing you their GDP, and that's just kind of the standard, and that's what we have. So think about the alternatives, but also use GDP because that's what everybody uses. But also remember that it's missing a whole bunch of uh, important aspects of the economy that aren't being measured, and so it's not a perfect way of, of measuring the health of the economy. Um, so that is how we measure stuff. If you head over to the resources page, you can see an example of how to do some of this inflation calculation. Um, and it should be fun.